Thank you so much, Ben, for making this program possible with your technological wizardry. Uh, thank you to all of you out there for your interest in our program. As Ben said, my name is Steve Hindle. I'm uh, the Keck Foundation Director of Research here at the Huntington, where I oversee the fellowship program, the conference program, and the lecture program. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of our public lectures in the humanities uh, from the research division in this academic year. This particular talk is the Kemble Lecture in Maritime History, which was endowed in honor of John Haskell Kemble, an influential uh, American maritime historian. And the endowment was made for the specific purpose of drawing attention to the Huntington's remarkable holdings in maritime history, especially the Kemble Collection itself. Last year's speaker was Peter Moore, whose award-winning study of the fate of Captain Cook's ship Endeavour attracted the praise on both sides of the Atlantic. And we're no less lucky uh, in having as our speaker this evening, Shawande Mustakin, who is Associate Professor of History and African American Studies in the Department of History at Washington University in St. Louis. Shawande holds her BA in African American Studies from Elon College, her MA in African American and African Studies from Ohio State University, and a PhD in comparative black history from Michigan State. She's held fellowships from the Gilda Lehrman Institute of American History and from the American Historical Association. She is widely known and recognized for a really remarkable book, Slavery at Sea, Terror, Sex and Sickness in the Middle Passage, which appeared in 2016, which was awarded the Wesley Logan Prize by the American Historical Association for the best book on the history of the African diaspora. She's also the 2020 recipient of the Dred Scott Freedom Award in the category of historical literacy. As is usual in our Zoom webinar format, our speakers kindly agreed to pre-record her presentation, which we will pause about halfway through and encourage you to use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. And at the end, Shawande, who is two hours ahead of us in St. Louis, will take questions live. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Shawande Muscatine to discuss waves of calamity, race, water, and power in the evolution of slavery's memory. Well, thank you for the introduction. I'd really like to thank everyone for being here. This is really a momentous time. I'm very grateful to the Huntington Library for seeing value to invite me into really this conversation about maritime and history. So again, I'm really grateful to be here and I look forward to the questions afterwards. So thank you. Thank you for being here today. And it is an honor to be here before all of you all. We all stand at the tipping point globally of many unexpected ever changing. And today, again, it's a, it is an honor to be here and to be here a part of such momentous conversations happening, happening nationally and worldwide as we all attempt to reckon with the past in order to know who we truly are, but even more steep within the history of slavery and slavery at sea. My intention today most is to spark engagement and remembrance through the unexpected and through unexpected ways. Where, are we, where are we today in our remembrance of slavery and even more slavery at sea? My talk today entitled Waves of Calamity, Race, Water and Power and the Evolution of Slavery's Memory it really ties in with where we are in many ways, where some will say we're immersed within a watershed moment in history, but it is well far beyond that. In fact, I argue that where we are today in a year undone and in the beginning of a decade within the year 2020, we stand within a continuum comprised of defining bloodshed moments in global history that invite us to think on the historic connections while also interlinking to systems racially anchored within our nations and the national histories that we tell based on a slaving past. I've been studying slavery and writing about slavery 
for many years, perhaps two decades, some would argue, and more of these conversations are beginning to happen. Yet years later, much has continued. Some would say it hasn't changed, much would say it has. Race still matters, blood is still spilled, and the battles rage on on who and what should be nationally remembered. History is still being told while histories are often still battled over the need for inclusion or exclusion and thus in truth overlooked and forgotten. I've been fortunate to be a part of many conversations and the varying institutions across the country and across the world who are beginning to take a mirror to their past across the country and again across the world as we grapple and we choose to grapple with even more. My intention today is to prompt us to go deep through the meaning that we make of this horrific period of bondage from the 15th to the 19th century. But it is also about expanding remembrance towards the critical sites where slavery and bond people were invariably made that is vastly far from celebratory. There is nothing celebratory about slavery, but as a human history, it reveals an evolution of slavery's memory. So for many years, I have sought to disrupt those gendered, these gendered expectations that have persisted for over 120 years, which has meant the outright exclusion of the Middle Passage and the many, many, many types of people centered, sold, bought and sold within the global market, and yet left out of the narratives of memory and memorialization. And so our showing up today, it is a testament to courage, to having the courageous and taking the courageous steps of remembrance and healing. Next. So in starting, I wanna make us mindful. Slavery haunts the present. But who are the ones that we choose to remember? Maybe for a moment or maybe, how dare we also say that we choose to remember infinitely. So I like to open up so people can see how I dedicated the book for the centuries of women, men, children, and sages whose collective lives will be infinitely remembered and they will be remembered and they are remembered in slavery at sea. Yet if slavery haunts the present, not all are attuned or willing to engage with this history, meanings or the evolving consequences of silences. This fall, I am teaching a course, History, Murder in the Archive, and another course, Mapping the World of Quote Unquote Black Criminality, which both classes are opening conversations for future minds to understand not only that murder happens during slavery, that it happens routinely within the cycles of violence common within the entangled cycles of bondage, but also that hyper surveillance and the over policing of black bodies. It did not begin in Louisville. It did not begin in LA. It did not begin in New York, Atlanta or Chicago, but instead aboard slave ships through the interactions of captains, sailors and transported captives. For this, I commonly have to remind the future to ponder two important questions. What are the dangers of not paying attention to slavery's past? Even more, what do we know of slavery's history so deeply that it need not be remembered any further? Where we are at reflects the variations and struggles in society concerning whether or not to take more seriously slavery's complicated history. The moment that we stand in also begins to allow a glimpse into these evolving battlegrounds of public memory and public silence around slavery. Slavery at sea stands in a long black historiography on the slave trade that began in 1896 with W.E.B. Du Bois through his Harvard dissertation. And decades more would pass until many black scholars, including Eric Williams, Walter Rodney, Carter G. Woodson, Daryl Wax, Lorenzo Green, would extend Du Bois's call to expose the contours and human consequences of this massive international slave trade 
and North America's participation in and sub substantial benefit from it. But Slavery at Sea, and what we're gonna be talking about today, this one-of-a-kind book, it really begins to bring many histories together. It expands many historiographies, and most especially a watery world that many take for granted, although central to the making and unmaking of slavery and people, where in which the maritime world and culture connected with a global slaving traffic, that it all would be contained within, again, this watery world deserving of far deeper discussion. So as I moved throughout New York City, Rhode Island, Liverpool, London, Boston, Jamaica, South Carolina, North Carolina, just to name a few, among a host of other former ports, but other spaces and archival places that begin to expand the terrain of at least 25 archives that I traveled to, to begin to tell these stories. And in so doing, I let the sources and their ghosts lead me. I trained my eyes to read 18th century script more easily. I perused historic newspapers, diaries, ship logs, merchants' correspondence, mortality lists, surgeons' letters, along with the myriad of slavery's other surviving, surviving relics that further inform the network and the worlds of people. Most of all, in the writing of Slavery at Sea, I follow paper trails towards looking towards overlooked sources to help show how this history is still deeply untold in the people and the terror-centric meanings. The archives I searched for and mined through, they led me down many roads less traveled. They took me beyond national waters and through many unexpected routes by interrogating a history of the British and the American maritime worlds of slavery and thus two nations intricately involved, intricately connected to the building of wealth off of the buying and selling of black people. It poses new questions that enable the interrogation of the larger land and seascape of archival sources useful in telling the human histories for so long that have been unheard by centering gender even more deeply. This book, Slavery at Sea, it intentionally counters the tendency to rely on narratives that solely illustrate the life, resistance, and deaths of slavery primarily through the stories of muscled Black men that in turn ensures the dehistoricizing of Black women, Black girls, and Black boys in slavery's alchemy of horrors. Perhaps most central, and for me, intellectually exciting and necessary to our conversation today, is how the ocean is conceptualized. And within slavery at sea and within my mind of understanding of the varying layers and sites of slavery, it is about understanding how the watery path of the Atlantic became the most powerful base and this powerful mode of mobility but likewise, the unparalleled tool of slavery that lied within the water, that willingly accepted deposits of living or dead black bodies, but permanently hid forever the fatalities of slavery, which infinitely fused, thereby inextricably tying man to the sea. Slavery at Sea considers how slavery functioned outside the locus of plantations, because throughout the book, I argue and I critically read and reconceptualize the social space of ships and the ocean as epicenters in the making and unmaking of bond people as the oceanic transport served as a lifeline of evolving new world economies, but also as these variegated seaborne pathways operated as a primary isolated channel through which foreign people, Black people, would arrive throughout the diaspora. And through this, I interlink the land and the sea reconnecting both worlds that we once took for granted and kept separate, bypassing the very process which landed African people into and throughout and across, the, across plantations. 
Slavery is understood most times through the landed sites. However, the Atlantic Ocean represented here is bloody because the history is deeply immersed in blood. The Atlantic Ocean explains more than just mere watery highways and routes for the transport of goods, unless we forget the buying and selling of people as goods, which was central on the sea, through the sea, over the waters that would make the Atlantic Ocean become a viable and transformative space of history and perhaps the most viable agent and tool of white violence that was used across the ocean. But yet, slavery at sea really pushes this conversation. When we integrate the conversations of maritime history, as well as histories of the African diaspora, this is where it is about understanding that the ocean is not just where slavery happens, but it is also how Black bodies were ferried across the Atlantic for over four centuries. But then it is also about comprising the central conduit for how bondage unfolded and permanently devastated lives within an arena, a power zone, and an agency, and even what I've argued a zone of death represented within the Atlantic Ocean. So through this and through my conversations, conversations are really wanting to center the beginnings, the birth of slavery at sea. It is also recognizing the critical importance and emergence of a subfield, which I define as middle passage studies, because in so doing, we can no longer permit the sidelining of these bloodied human histories. It is about centralizing these seaborne passages and what detonates out at sea. The transatlantic slave trade is reconceptualized for me as the human manufacturing process that is comprised of a violently multi-staged disruptive process that included, next, warehousing, transport, and delivery. And as I move, I wanna share, I wanna go to a story I like stories, histories, her stories. But this story, while I will remind people it's not in Slavery at Sea, it has become the most critical framing for my conversations that have evolved through Slavery at Sea. For some, this is very familiar within the work that I've done because this article that I would publish in 2011 would be the placeholder for what would become even more and amplify a conversation centering Black females within the Atlantic slave trade. So in telling this particular story of this woman who has been with me for many years, she has comprised a primary door opener, a key holder for all of us to begin to see, remember, and restore memory of the unnamed, the overlooked, and those deemed useless in the telling of slavery at sea. On June 15, 1791, sailor John Cranston gave testimony, quote, concerning a Negro woman said to have been thrown overboard off the American slave vessel Polly. He detailed the complex events, foregrounding the actions of Rhode Island slave trader and ship captain James DeWolf and the ensuing murder. Cranston's recollections reinforced the power that DeWolf held as master over both captives and sailors within the open sea. The locus of white male power, however, lies most prominently within the life of an enslaved black female weakened by smallpox whose shipboard presence led to her treatment or mistreatment and therein as a threat to which she was treated. As a threat to the ship's voyage, as well as to the envisioned future profits, thereby facilitating her death. While likewise complicating meanings on an enslaved body, diseased and female, and sold into the global slave market. In the course of three or four days, according to archival records, quote, 
Her disorder increased so as to become offensive and to render it dangerous for her to remain on board." Unquote. Alarmed by her continued weakness, DeWolf called an emergency meeting with the vessel's crew to consider the most effective strategy for the woman's medical condition and her final stay aboard the Polly. Playing upon the threat of contamination, he emphasized, quote, if we keep the slave here, she will give it to the rest, both sailors and those held captive. Captain Jim, he chose to act upon what he envisioned as the only option at his seafaring disposal. He asked the men if they were, quote, willing to heave the woman overboard, which according to archival records, generated several unsatisfactory responses counter to his deadly thoughts. Yet in his mind, no alternative was left but to let the woman go off the ship. And more importantly, to quote, throw this one so dangerously affected, infected off board, off the poly. The woman's deadly fate loomed in his mind where in which he quote, talked of it one or two times the day before she was thrown overboard. Invoking his power as shipmaster, he ordered another sailor, Thomas Gordon, to go up with him to the woman's separate holding. And there, the two men, quote, lashed her in a chair, tied a mask around her eyes and mouth, plausibly to prevent any immediate bodily contamination, as well as to hinder her from seeing or disrupting the men from restricting her movements with quote, a tackle hooked upon the, hooked around the slings, around the chair. This permitted DeWolf and Gordon to maneuver her down to the hands of four sailors awaiting below. Amid the woman's removal off ship, each of these men became collective accessories in her forthcoming overthrow. Reinforcing superiority in his role as shipmaster the fundamental basis of Captain Jim's use of these four men rested on the practical dimension of removing the bound woman off ship, which of course required many hands. Following transfer to the next level of the vessel, she was landed in the rails and lowered down by two sailors. And as, the, as they moved the captive female off the poly, her dangling body swayed, quote, right forward and left thence until she was dropped into the oceanic waters beneath. Once fully immersed in the makeshift watery grave, quote, she hollered after she was down, end quote, demonstrating that despite being enfeebled, she was very much alive. According to Stockman and Clannon, the jettison incident was, quote, far from being accompanied with malice or wantonness, in its intentions against the woman. Instead, the circumstances at hand compelled DeWolf and the crew, quote, to adopt this disagreeable alternative as the only method available to claim the necessary relief. And at the moment of discovery of the woman's medical condition, this difference grew drastically paramount among the mariners, demonstrating how a disease, quote, transformed into something shameful and revolting into something quite alienating. And as such, the othering of this enslaved woman moved her from the status of exploitable commodity, reinforcing racial differences that further marked her body as thus African, female, and diseased. We may never come to readily understand how and if the participating seamen replayed the jettison incident in their minds or psychologically suppressed the final moments of her time aboard. The alleged compulsory nature of the bond woman's violent removal, however, does not diminish the possibility of affect left upon participating or remaining crewmen throughout the remaining voyage, once docked or even at different points in their later lives. On the other hand, for Captain Jim, DeWolf, unfazed by the female's forcible disappearance, quote, very near half an hour after the poly sailed onward from the woman's deserted body, a nearby sailor overheard DeWolf remark, quote, 
he was sorry he lost so good a chair. I share this woman's story because her story matters. I share this woman's story who's left in the archive as simply a Negro wench. I share her story to push back against the long scholarly and public practice of centering adult black men as the only ones scarred in their souls by the pain of bondage. I share this story and continue to as a framework to understand millions more because it prominently forces us to consider, critically consider, and perhaps to begin to broaden the spectrum of the human merchandise, those who were included, mistreated and sold as captive black bodies, whether sound or diseased. These captive bodies that were held and terrorized on and off land, on and off ships, being made spectacles out of the racialized confinement within and across and between the spaces of the Atlantic. I continue to tell this woman's story as a larger framework for slavery at sea because she faced the racial wrath of white fears. That meant she in turn was forced to face the tormenting and the permanent power actively held within the seafaring world to hide and permanently seal the ending of life, of black life, of many black lives, which also within the water and the secreting of the violence enacted. That means within the water contains many secrets ritualized throughout slavery without ending. Gender, race, water, and power, it speaks to a history we know very little of, but it is time to begin to texturize and understand the full totality of slavery and the many represented within the high seas, including Black people, Black bodies, and Black voices, as bond people, as well as sailors. This woman's story hurts. And her story of suffering makes us also have to confront a landscape of slavery's forgotten. As her captors sought to conceal and further devalue this woman's life, it is parallel to the remaking and the destruction of many forced within the trade. Some people assume and even question if this is a black story or a white story. Quite simply, this book it is a holistic attempt together to bring together the lives of many people, different people invoked and even forgotten that fueled such a trade and a legalized traffic in black bodies. The book beginning and so-called ending with water from the waves of calamity to a tide of bodies and the varying contours in between, this book sets out to detail the last full century when slavery was not only fa a fashionable way of being in the world, but when free market trade in the 18th century meant slaving vessels were the least regulated branch of commerce, thereby leaving the recently bought and shipped captives fully prey to the moments of their captors, far from sight, public view, or any perceived notion of outcry. The cost to not talking about the human manufacturing system, to not talking about slavery at sea, to not talking about the bloodied waters and the bones that lie at the bottom of the ocean, to not talk about it. Silences prevail, but emphatically it conveys denial of participation, but the greatest cost that I continue to find is that it creates the folklorizing of black history, the privileging of largely heroic white narratives of those untarnished, untouched and thus unlured by race and slavery as if all were abolitionists. I wrote this book centered in the 18th century to show slaving before the massive rise of before the massive global rise of abolitionism and the fatigue of slavery's memory. I did so again to allow a glimpse into the legalized slave trading period that went 
from the 15th century onward through the early, throughout the early 19th century. But most, I use the book to counter the silences, the choosing of numbers over people's bloodied histories that was invariably created at sea. Waves of calamity. It begins by getting us to think about not only these ordered desires that are coming from distant merchants, but also thinking about the rules of engagement, as well as the inner spaces and outer boundaries that show us in real human time, how the cycles of violence became the entrapment for how many black people throughout, they, were experience, they would experience the totality of bondage from the point of capture to the point of sale. They faced violence at every turn and the arrival of foreign sailors in a tumultuous landscape, it led to the making and unmaking of black bodies, forcing scores of captives to either be sold or killed. By foregrounding the integrated lives of sailors, enslaved and surgeons, we can gain closer insight into the array of middle passage workers globally interlinked through threads of power, exploitation, as well as deprivation that they had acted upon through the slave trade. And all in all, the point is really the center that sla the slavery at sea was fueled, maintained, and thereby sustained for over four centuries through what I described to represent an amalgamation of men, money, and power. Imagined bodies. I attempt to get us further in our lexicon to make us more knowledgeable, far more knowledgeable in the vast array of human merchandise made available on global markets. We can no longer understand these people as merely adult black men and adult black women without intellectually making meaning of many more represented, the children, the diseased, the elderly, as well as the refused. I offer an entree to likewise consider the barometer of enslaved health, as well as the contentious fate of the most overlooked, undervalued group historically, well, I would argue that they continue, or that for very long that they continue to be refused, even by the telling of history, or refused in the telling of slavery's memory and the history, but yet within slavery at sea, no longer are they refused. No longer are they overlooked and omitted, but they are instead centered. So we can then make sense of those who were left behind and the violence that again would be detonated upon those who were unsold and had no value within white currency, white gaze or anywhere within the trade. It is really within chapter three and even four and five and six and arguably seven that were then placed out at sea within this chapter, chapter three, healthy desires and toxic realities, we must come face to face with the reality of the allocation of food, water, or maybe the allocation of less than. The small amounts of water, thinking about the toxicity aboard slave ships, as well as thinking about the unending, ever shifting weather patterns, all of this contributes to the full body breakdown, to, be, to the beginning in the makings and the unmakings, again, of enslaved people. Because violence is very central to this book and it is expanded and rethought in whole new ways. But much like plantation owners, sailors were never, quote, in control as fully as they would have liked. Crewmen often remained focused on preventing the outbreak of revolts. However, within the history, we have forgotten and perhaps even overlooked the varying sites, the varying battlefields. There's the ship, there's the ocean, but then there's the bodies of those enslaved. So here I am expanding our understanding of violence to include Black women who demonstrated, used their bodies as a critical site in these battlefields. And they did so with sailors and, sh and ship captains by intentionally claiming the lives of their unborn children, whether aboard the ship same, 
ironically named same, in 1793, where a black woman would take the life of her child. And unfortunately, because of complications that would emerge, she too would die. But then three years later, a similar incident, this time aboard the ship Mary in 1796, another black woman would take the life of her child and so doing, she would succumb to her resistive efforts. These cases reveal that the bodies of bond women served as critical and active sites of power while their wombs became tombs where in which their children were to their mothers. Wow, their mothers may have been viewed as defiant by their captors. They would also be ruled or seen and treated as defiant for ruining lives and destroying valuable property that was central to the entanglement of slavery. And so from violence, we then have to think about the exacting toll of violence, the psyche and how that is affected. And so within chapter five, battered bodies and feeble minds, suicide and the emotional wounds of slavery and displacement are centered so that we can no longer deny the stressful experiences that are forced upon bond people males and females. Throughout this chapter, the intention is to show that this was not about the giving up on life, but more so beginning to reveal the variance of power, that it may not always be through violent means that are seen through ship revolts, but then there's the psychological battles that will emerge. So again, throughout the book, you're also seeing me talk about the, these mobile battlefields. One of the other primary battlefields would be within the minds of the many. And so I turn attention really to the gendering of psychological instability in, in the varying ways really trying to show that both black men and black females became broken down and affected by the trade. The ocean represents varying meanings and needs for both sailors and captives. On the one hand, it served as a repository of bodies death, pain, and suffering. Yet on the other hand, it comprised a multifaceted arena where desires, hopes, and dreams were enacted as bodies were set into motion, moving across within and through these watery spaces. Moreover, symbolically, water has held a long, enduring, and delicate relationship with people of African descent, and even more as fugitives. And so within chapter five, the ocean, for me, served as what I argue is a portal to flee from slavery and to move into other cosmic spaces. Taken together and seeking to escape slavery by oceanic means, what this says is that bond people fled ships not merely bound for death, but much like bands of fugitives known across the Caribbean, as well as the Americas, they ran towards a natural sanctuary akin to a maroon community inhabited by spiritual forces that lied beyond the grasp and the control of their slavers within the abode of the sea. And most of all, what is for certain is that by jumping overboard and out of reach of their designated guards, slave ship runaways were able to reclaim their former lives, identities, and in turn, detonate prominent independence from a life of human bondage remotely envisioned for them, again, by distant merchants. Next. Bond people would die from a variety of bodily responses to trauma, stress, violence, and most of all, most of all, deplorable shipboard treatment. In chapter six, The Anatomy of Suffering, I turn considerable attention to the body of captives at sea to likewise turn attention to the gendered connections of slavery and as well as of ill health, showing how males and females died from a variance of medical causes that would lead to the decline of one's body, mind, and soul, which would include such things as, yes, miscarriages, venereal diseases, as well as abortions, and also even torn scrotums. So we're seeing again this gender variance that really would come through the trade as well as through the tools that would be used to keep people within confinement. 
Water holds and is undeniably integral to the connection of black bodies in the history of slavery. And within chapter seven, a tide of bodies. <clears throat> it is about looking at what, who, the types of people that are in, imported, but also how they arrive. So as we think about the sea, we also have to think about, again, yes, the cheap investment in the transport. But we also have to think about the tremendous burdens, the stresses that became manifested on the bodies of those within the trade. And this is evidenced most by a letter that was written September 4th, 1792 by a commander of the ship Fame. He reported on the transport of captives from Old Calabar to Granada while explaining that he had buried 65 captives to which he added, quote, God knows I hope I shall never experience the uneasiness of mine as I have this passage. And right, rightfully so, given the high loss of enslaved people. But however, he went further to note that he was, quote, endeavoring to get the remaining captives up through as much meat and drink will do to, their, to improve their conditions. Because as he detailed even further, one captive imported for future sales was, quote, blind with one eye, while a reported number of others were, quote, losing fingers and toes, forcing the captain to conclude, I am afraid it will be a low average anticipated within future sales. The import of disabled captives is central to the interlinking of slavery at sea to the plantations and to the varying plantations across the Americas, because what it does is it reinforces the violent nature and subsequent cheap investment, again, in the transport, uh, and not just the warehousing, but within the transport of those at sea that would lead to delivery, to the delivery and the import of those throughout the Americas. But what is even more important is to think about the tools of slavery so that this violent nature of the trade and this cheap investment, but it's essentially the chains and the shackles that comprise the prominent tools of control used aboard slave ships, these tools, once captives were bound and their bodies were restricted, their blood flow, their blood, blood supply, in turn, the tightening of the manacles of the cuffs themselves, they would create the wounds and the damages that sailors were employed to manage. So again, I'm inviting us to consider there's the people in the enactment of violence, but then there's also the tools that are utilized aboard slave ships. Variants of lingering injuries as well as weakened immune systems only further fueled the devastation, which taken together, this entire history exposes the utility of the body and showing how once forced into trade, transported and imported, what did they look like? How were they treated in the process and how did they arrive into the Americas? Because at every point in the trade, the scars and the vestiges of the Middle Passage were fully seen within enslaved people's bodies, their minds, as well as their spirits. The ugly of race in America society today persists in part because what do we do with the history of slavery? What meaning do we make of it? And the terrorizing of others fueled through and by the cycle of human manufacturing system that connected Buyers, sellers, brokers, universities, shipbuilders, physicians, medical students, grave robbers, and slavery's many more. It emboldened these uninterrupted outplays of supreme racial power that would further extend off ship. And in ending, I really wanted, there is the telling of the history, but then there is the meaning making of it. And so here, I really pushed the envelope to begin to think about what I argue is the Frankenstein of slavery. What is it about the middle passage that we don't want to remember? What is it about that we're willing to jump into plantations and bypass the very process? Again, slavery at sea, which is critical in the making and the unmaking of enslaved people. 
To deny a history is to essentially say it didn't happen or that it holds no importance. So again, my intent is to give greater meaning and to make meaning of the memory and the public memory. How do we want to remember slavery? Who are we remembering? Again, this middle passage, I argue that it brings together two worlds that often are very separate. We can think of Frankenstein, but then Frankenstein's monster. So I sort of liken the history of slavery and its memory, sort of the, I always talk about the ghosts that linger. They're waiting to be remembered. And within this history, there are those that we don't want to remember. And those that we want to lock away, those stories never to be told or to never reveal the centuries of unrelenting terror and devastation enacted on black people to advance the wealth of white merchants, families and growing global businesses. Without attending to the wholesale violence in this whole enterprise, a commercial enterprise and an economy of violence of which slavery at sea and the human manufacturing process will be predicated upon. This is where we're seeing the engineering of slavery at sea and we're seeing this disjointed history. But at this point now it's about reconnecting a full industry that carried on a full system for many centuries without engagements on what some deem a stain in global history evidenced by slavery, then we willingly allow ourselves to stay steeped in the privileging of memory to say essentially almost that slavery didn't happen. All people, all communities, all hearts, all types of students, the future, the present, even the past. We need to reckon with this racially complicated past that we are all intimately tied to. Never again should we forget or be unwilling to invoke or be unwilling to cry meaningful tears for those made central to the world of slavery at sea. When we pick and choose favorites in history, when we leave the water out of the history of slavery, then we're unable to see the powers, the layers of powers, the critical sites of slavery that go overlooked and unforgotten. Again, in the many contours of slavery and its people and its making. So each of us today, we have a choice to do better, to remember the histories. And history itself is based on the memory, the nuances, the contours, and most what we choose to tell, what truths or alterations we choose to teach. And for, and for some others, it is also about what we choose to omit and thereby render within a shadowed slaving past. We will continue to confront the ghosts that linger. They yearn to be invoked and thus remembered. The ghosts may linger, but through slavery at sea and the nuanced conversations forged by linking humans and the sea of blood made through terror, bloodshed, as well as greed that would go on for over four centuries, the future is most equipped to confront these historic ghosts of varying gendered kind that for so long, we in the contemporary world, we have not only denied, but told others that they were not real and that as such racial calamities never happen. And in so doing, we're then leading into again, what I brought up earlier about the folklorizing of black history. Slavery happened and then it's what we do about it. Again, as a nation, we have to think about slavery. How do we wanna tell it in the future? What stories, whose stories, how do we tell them where do sailors fit? Where do surgeons fit? Whose story is it? Whose history? Whose history? There are many people intricately connected within, again, the system and industry, as well as an institutional system that would lead to a bloodied making of a newer history and those many histories that would come. So again, in talking, we can then learn that the silences matter. To leave one or a great many out is to only write a disjointed history. And today it is about, and what I attempted to do today was to create a new arc for us to begin to understand, again, the history 
the memory and the varying people as well as the cycle of violence anchored within it. Thank you. Uh, your book is an essential read um, and it makes for a very uncomfortable listen and that's entirely appropriate in the presentation that you've just given. There are a large number of very interesting questions in the Q&A. I want to lead off with one um, that takes the episode that you, the appalling episode that you described in the first part of the presentation. Uh, and the question is really um, from Carla Boykin about whether um, that episode is anomalous. How unusual is it to have uh, such a well-documented episode of a female slave in particular being thrown overboard? Thank you and great question because that has been the hardest quest to find women in the history, in the maritime history and even more. Um, <clears throat> the story that I was reading from, in fact, there were very few sources. So I questioned myself as a historian, did I have enough? And then there's about asking new questions, even more of those that are not represented. And so it is not an anomaly, but yet it is. It is so in fact, I actually saw one of the other questions that was asking about the Zong. So if I were to put this and put that this together, then what is very interesting is that you have two nations that are confronted with the exact same story, a story of overthrow, and they are 10 years apart. So in fact, Zong, which has happened in 1781, it would be a part of the long history, but it would be a turning point within British history to then reckon with what does it mean to then find out that 133 people were thrown overboard. But then when we shift to, well, in fact, because of that, then you see a law that would come search, uh, the Sir Dalbians Act or the Slave Trade Act of 1788. But that then is sort of ensuring that we have a slave ship surgeon aboard a vessel. However, on the American side, this is really revealing the coming ending of the trade and knowing that more conversations are starting to begin across the Atlantic with the ending or the coming end of the slave trade meant becoming, me, becoming even more aggressive in the trade. But yet the truth and all of what I'm saying is that the secreted world of the maritime world itself actually makes it hard for us to really calculate how common that this was. So that said, the story stands only a, among maybe one or two within the world that really centers a story of a black female, but there's still many more questions that we can go and really delving into these, these sources, especially in the legal slave trading period, so. Thank you. So there are a couple of questions here about gender. So how much do we know about the gender division on slave ships? What about uh, relative numbers of male and female slaves? Were they segregated? And do we know whether the death rate for men was greater than that for women? Right, thank you. The gender question has really sort of been, again, I will always emphasize about how difficult it is when you begin to include other people. When we leave it just with adult black males, then it really has been the generalizing that has gone on for so long, really essentially from 1969 onward. And so now really it is about thinking about the legal slave trading era, the illegal slave trading era, and then we think about where these ships are going. And so if we're thinking about the Caribbean, we are seeing high volumes in going perhaps to Barbados or in other places, but yet other places, there would be the equal, but I would really say that there would be higher amounts of men predominantly, oftentimes more 60%, but yet it would really depend on, I would say the time period. It would depend, are we talking at the beginning of the century, the middle or the end? Are we talking about the shift of government monopoly? Or are we talking about private trade? What I'm centered on in the 18th century is really looking at private trade that essentially, it almost makes it difficult to essentially quantify again because we don't have an over, uh, overarching umbrella. It becomes more about these distant merchants. So again, we do see variants. We do see separation of females and males. Typically males will be put in the bottom hold and then females will be located up top with children in a separate hold, sometimes near where the storage um, places can be with arms. But again, in the illegal slave trading period, we see the tight packing in a whole other way take on a whole other level. So again, for the fact that this went on for four, um, for four centuries, we see variants over time from the 15th through the 19th century. 
Thank you. While we're talking about gender, um, there's a question from Hazel about motherhood. And she wonders whether you see a connection between enslaved African mothers taking the lives of their babies on slave ships with the pro-abortion argument taken by many women of color today. Ooh, wow, that's a, that's a difficult one. It's quite a leap. Um, well, I'm not really sure I could really, I'd never really try to make that direct link of slavery to now. However, it is, it does provide an opportunity to look at how have black women been viewed within this realm of motherhood. So that means that you see a lot of racial stereotypes that I talk about within the book that we hadn't considered before. So within this trade itself, there's no, it doesn't matter what black woman you pull on. Oh, this black woman can nurse this child. So essentially we're sort of seeing the devaluation of black women, black motherhood, where the destruction of the black family is beginning within the slave trade. So motherhood and how we're seeing it now, it, we have a lot more societal differences. We're in a completely different century to, to sort of have to really think about the context. However, again, we really do need to think about those links of motherhood and it, again, how even a government has thought about it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, sure. Rob, Rob Bonner, who gave a lecture related to some of these themes uh, a couple of weeks ago, has got a very interesting question about memory and memorialization. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings about the exploration of the wrecks of slave ships? What does it mean to go underwater to bear witness to maritime atrocities and calamities on this massive scale? Um, sure. and what questions do those, what ethical questions does that kind of uh, underwater exploration raise for you? Thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. Bonner, for being here and also for the advertisement for the talk. And memory and memorialization, it matters because obviously right now where we are in the world, we're having to think about space and then the lack of interaction and being able to really sort of reckon with the past through spaces that have been constructed. That said, I have thought about water and this connection and even more when I was thinking about the black divers and historically, particularly in the 90s, where we saw the rise of more black divers really trying to recover these histories. So, and bringing us where we are, where now we're having the more slave ships that are emerging, again, this whole, these ghosts that linger, it, it is time. It's time to reckon with it. And then again, what can we do with it? So now we're having to think about archives and museums and then the traffic, the finger traffic, the physical traffic. How do we begin to get our students to be there with it and be fully present? And yet, um, I think that these questions, they're gonna go on even more. And I would actually argue that they're getting even more complicated as one who grew up in Stone Mountain, Georgia, to then have to reckon with the history decades later, and then to also live here in St. Louis where the history is all around us that is connected to slavery. So. Memory and memorialization, I feel like, is taken on some very political context that we still have more that we need to deal with with the national level and the local level. But then in the water side of it, we've not gone that far and hopefully we will see more. So I say if we have those who are willing to go to those depths literally and figuratively, go. I, for me, you know, water, yep, great. I wrote about it. I'm not certain that I could choose to do that, but that really is also another point of confrontation, not confrontation, but in confronting a past that we need people to do that. So I'm all for it. Mm, so thank you. you. Um, so it's obvious from everything you've said about the scale of the industry and the economic uh, resources that were poured into the slave trade, that uh, the bodies of these uh, men and women were regarded as economic assets. Is there evidence, asks Andrea, that slaves were cared for during sea voyages to protect their value, to preserve their value, to prevent depreciation of their value? That's an interesting question. Care in and of itself. Um, it's hard for me to locate care in, in, in the realm of slavery um, and even more within slavery at sea because of the whole private world. What do people do when no one's looking? Um, I would say that we would... The one group that I think of most who would have a, a deeper investment in another way would be the, the presence of slave ship surgeons. So in that way, the bodies, both living and dead, you want access to that. So the, the care, no matter how minimal, again, the cheap preservation is pervasive all throughout the trade, but 
there would be the minimal uh, maintaining of health so that way you could learn. So in that way, we could see that there. But then the question should be raised about how far did their careers go once on land? How did they begin to take these experiences and essentially profit all over again? So we are seeing the beginnings. I'm pointing attention because I do medical history. So when we think about health care, then sure, let's think about that. But it really wasn't a care that we really want to believe was there, but it's more about uh, care within slavery is deeply steeped in the violence and yet the benefit of it all the time. Right, understood. Um, question from Reva Hicks that uh, picks up on the implications of health and maltreatment at sea. Given the horrors that enslaved people suffered, or how many of them were capable of harsh manual labor once the ships reached their destination? Good question. And this is where I end my book at the point of sale. So that way then plantation scholars can go and quantify how many people off of this particular ship lived all the way through the cycle of slavery. Is that 30 years? Is that 10 years? Is that five years? This is then inviting this bigger conversation about how enslaved people cope with the shock of enslavement. Some barely lasted weeks from the moment of being imported. Some others, they were able to live through all these horrors and that then we do see a generational legacy forged. But to be honest with you, I cannot quantify what happens on land and interlinking it that way. However, maybe in the future, this is a, a whole new area that we really should be attentive to more as we are thinking about bodies and yet sort of the, the interplay of um, disease at any given moment. Thank you. Um, a couple of the questions here reference Charles Johnson's novel, The Middle Passage. Uh -huh. And uh, one person is wondering, in the light of that novel, what your own view on the question of reparations for slavery oh. is. Oh, well, and thank you for invoking what has been an iconic text. There's so many iconic texts that I feel like should never have been forgotten. Um, well, and now we do stand at a whole new meaning of reparations now. I even think about 20 years ago when I was reading Randall Robinson's The Debt, what, what America owes to Black people. Now we're back at this question now, what can that look like? For myself, because now reparations is even more come up in these conversations, for me it's even more about education. It is about the full investment within education. I can look at that not just on the collegiate level, but beginning to think about superior education that really needs to be poured in both digitally as well as in person. So reparations is when people can get an opportunity to, 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 to advance themselves in that way. And there never was equality even in coming with the ending of slavery itself, not with the ending of the slave trade in, in um, North America or within um, the Caribbean and um, in all of, or with the British slave trade either. So um, we're gonna be, it's going to be a difficult conversation going forward. It continues to be because there's so many different versions that we all can see. But as an educator, I would like to see the investment in education. And more importantly, hey, let's think about some investments in the studying of slavery. Absolutely. Here, here. Uh, there's a question here from Zerwa Chowdhury. Hello, Zerwa. How are you? Um, uh, and of course, Zerwa's very familiar with the research that's been done on other geographies of uh, slavery, especially in the Mediterranean Sea and in the Indian Ocean. So is it possible to think comparatively across these different histories? And what would that uh, do for our understanding of the Middle Passage? Would it make it look more characteristic or more atypical? I would say equally as characteristic, it's about, again, what really thinking about the water, both as it's a zone of activity and yet where people can remake themselves. And so when we're thinking about the movement of on and off land, in and out of these, again, secreted spaces, the water itself and that connection in connecting these histories, it really would magnify that whole understanding of humans and the sea and what we do. So I, they are not separated. It's just really sort of thinking about why is the ship being used? What's the investment? What's the, what's the purpose for the laborers that are there? But yet these histories are all very much interconnected across because it is about the, the movement of people, goods and ideas fundamentally and all the time. Right. There are so many wonderful questions in this Q&A here. It's a real <laughs> testament to the interest generated by your talk. We'll take a couple more, I think. Um, 
There's a question from Ramita Ray about uh, the typical slave diet on board mm. uh, in the Middle Passage. Um, so what were, what were they eating and what were the implications of diet? Sure, and I talk about that um, within this chapter of healthy bodies and toxic realities because again, this underscores the cheap investment within the trade all throughout. So that means that you're finding a lot of starchy foods. You're finding that there was there, you're not gonna find produce and healthy foods at all. That also means that you would find, yes, you may find cassava, you may find yams, you may find um, uh, the, the slobber sauce and the slobber dish that essentially the dumping together these dumplings and all these different sauces. But we also will see the giving out of molded food, molded bread, because if that's all that someone had access to, it's sort of, well, at least we gave them something. But then when we get to um, the distribution of water, that definitely does not ever get onto the level of how much someone should ever drink. It is always less than for every person. Um, so the diet part of it really could go deeper, um, I think, in the future as we think about um, just these private traders and yet what they would be willing to pay for with the food and with the, the water itself. But it was very, it was very scarce to say, to say the least. Interesting. And we'll take the closing question from Nancy Berman, who's speculating, I think, about the long-term psychological impact of water on the African-American psyche, the fear mm. of water in african -American. Oh, mm -hmm. that oh that comes up a lot. There is that, I've heard that about generational memory. And yeah. that would be difficult for some people to, if you will, scientifically trace. But while I do see it common, to be honest with you, for some it is about knowing about slavery, knowing about that history. For others, it is very real that perhaps within their family, but it is also where we leave that. That means where we're not trying to understand the deeper history of this connection of water and perhaps how water and this connection with African-Americans or people of African descent that we see agents. So this is where I would turn to Kevin Dawson's work and thinking about African-Americans as divers and really laborers within this watery world. So again, the water takes on so many different tones um, within the, the whole evolution of just the African diaspora that I think is definitely, it's gonna, it'll take us even deeper the, mer, the, the, the more that we want to probe, so. Terrific, so we're gonna have to close at that point. This presentation has been recorded with its Q&A and we will make it available uh, online. We have also uh, saved the Q&A and uh, either I or Shawandi will endeavor to answer the unanswered questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, over the course of the coming days and weeks. But I'm sure all of you out there, all of those of you who stayed with the program throughout, would want to join me in thanking Shawande Mastakin for an absolutely extraordinary and profoundly necessary talk. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Thank you.